ready for another exciting week of fantasy football in the God, three quarters of my team is on by spectacular. That is the week seven nightmare for all those who possess Steelers, Bills, and oh, so many other teams and franchises. I know uh, I had to raid every waiver wire and have guys who are likely projected to get approximately six points if I'm lucky this week. Hopefully you guys are faring better. Brandon, how you doing this week? I'm all right. Uh, coming off a, a Buffalo Bills loss on on Monday Night Football in front of America, so it could be a little better, but um, they have a bye, so they can't disappoint me this week. Got beat by an absolute freight train of a man. True story. I was sitting there thinking right about into the second quarter that, you know what, my fantasy scores might hold up and I might be okay. And immediately after I think that, off comes the 75-yard TD, and all my hopes and dreams die. But our other co-host, guy whose hopes and dreams never die, Kit, how you doing? <laughs> oh, pretty good. I, I thought it was only me who was dealing with bye week hell. Like, hopefully it'll help me uh, later, but it seems like all my teams, I'm, yeah, I'm starting guys using that I want to start. Uh, and unfortunately, last week might have been the week I accept that other people might be right about Daniel Jones not me and that he's not the answer uh he he hadn't done that this year and so i felt justified in, in defending him as you know uh oh it's all based on what he did you know last year with a bad supporting cast i mean it wasn't a good supporting cast but it was ugly and it was against the rams but still yeah you need a quarterback was... who can go tit for tat not one who loses Dude, you the game <laughs> i would suggest to you that that was definitely the perfect storm of suck right there facing a rams defense with tackles that are like guys you found wide yep. receivers that are guys you found and everyone you signed to make it better. It was hurt or suspended or couldn't play because they punched a dude in the head the previous week and broke their hand because yeah. genius. Yeah. Yeah. Tony yeah. dominated that first, that first drive. I uh, had like three for 40 or something like that. And then uh, hurt his ankle and now he's out this week, I guess. So i to wait on the excitement there. I'm just going to add, but before we move, before we move on um, the bye weeks uh, this week, the Bills, the Cowboys, the Jaguars, the Chargers, the Vikings, and the Steelers. So that's a ton of fantasy stars yeah. on those teams, a ton of studs. Um, but next week's a, a bit easier with just the Ravens and the Raiders off. So unless you have Lamar and Derek Carr as your super flex quarterbacks, it should be a little lighter. Yeah, and that's just the way it rolls in Dynasty World because there's no real preparing for the, for the bye weeks and how they land year to year. Unless you're in your startup year. You should really be ignoring it anyway. So it's just one of those deals where sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you don't. And for so many of us, we tend to draft our favorites over and over again or wind up acquiring players that we believe in because they happen to be available or we want to be the smartest person in the room. And then all lo and behold, you are hosed on multiple teams for the same week. So it just kind of is what it is especially with the way we tend to be with us fantasy junkies who have so many teams. You do the research, you put in all the work to find these guys, these diamonds in the rough, and the next thing you know, you're, every team you have is slammed with bye weeks or, or injuries hurt that much more. But things that hurt that much more include the Washington football team here because they've decided to scapegoat their kicker in typical Washington football team fashion and fire – all right, a kicker that wasn't super great in Dustin Hopkins, but decided to replace him with somebody that they added to the practice squad a week prior. The pride of Pitt, Chris Blewett, best name for a kicker possibly <laughs> ever. Man, mamas don't let your kids be kickers with the last name of Blewett. But there it is. He's, he's drawn an NFL check, so it must be good. But really, we're not actually caring about kickers here. We're looking at this as a symptom of a greater problem in Washington with the football team as in what's going on with them. Let's start in the running back situations here. Cause Gibson was on fire. People were drafting him high expectations were through the roof after an extremely good rookie campaign where he was very solid. And then we get this year, Brandon, what's, what's going on there. It's tough. He's been dealing with some lingering different, you know, injuries and ailments all season. He's he's kind of had the the questionable tag a bunch this season. And all of that injury noise makes me think back to his 
college career just two years ago when he got very, very minimal opportunities, both in the running and the passing game. And going into his rookie year last year, people were wondering, oh, can he actually take on a full NFL workload as the lead back? And he was fine last year. I believe he played 13 games. Um, But this year we might be seeing the effects of the increased workload, especially in a back-to-back year. And he, his body might not be able to handle it. It's definitely tougher to be the man than to be the accent piece. And it's definitely tougher when plan A at quarterback turns to plan B at quarterback, even though Heineke has really comported himself effectively and has been, you know, worth having and definitely a high value fantasy ad for a lot of people. It still speaks to his college track record. There was certainly concern. I know people, myself included, that had him on the do not draft lift list considering the hype when he was coming out because of a lack of a track record. But Kit, is the situation with him going to be now that we can't really trust him and we should be leaning on like a McKissick or somebody else in that backfield? Or is it ride with Gibson and be hopeful? So I think the format matters to some extent, right? I mean, in PPR, McKissick, it's weird. McKissick has like, in PPR, like a couple 17 plus point games and a couple 0.8 games, right? So he's not someone you can trust. Gibson's workload has been there. The passing game work hasn't, but I think, you know, even though it's it's not sexy, you get 21 carries for 64 yards, you're getting 21 carries, right? So you're a guy who you can, you, you can trust to get work. I think that whole team has just been weird. And maybe it's been Fat Fitzpatrick going down, but largely it's been the defense, which I expect it to be excellent being pretty bad right and so the the game scripts put them in two minute situations and they trust mckissick in those situations um so i I don't think he's uh you know somebody you you toss aside or i I can't see myself ever starting mckissick over him uh but definitely the ceiling comes down and and the hype that like he's gonna be mccaffrey they're gonna use him like that clearly they like mckissick in the role that he does with the pass catching uh Gibson gets a couple targets a game, so he's not completely a zero there. But it's it's not going to be, you know, a, a year where he has, you know, a thousand on the ground and, and, you know, 500 through the air or anything like that. So I'm tempering expectations. I'm backing off, probably not pursuing him in trades. Uh, but he's not a left for dead type of guy, I wouldn't say. I don't know, Brandon. Do you think he's a buy low candidate? I I still like his talent. Yeah, if, if somebody's, you know, soured on him, um, I'll, I'll send something out there, that's for sure. But... I think Kit brought up a good point about, you know, the the defense being just horrendous this year, especially a lot of people thought they would be top five, maybe even the best defense in the league. They've been the worst. They've, they've allowed the most points through six games out of any team in the league, more than the Giants, Dolphins, Chiefs, Jags, Texans, Lions, you name it. Um, so it hasn't really been great for him, and, and it's, you know, forced them to put McKissick on the field more. It's pretty mind-blowing, really, when you look at it. They were so good last year, and it was the pass rush and wave after wave of just dominant D-tackles and D-ends, pressuring quarterbacks, getting sacks, almost instant penetration to other teams' offensive lines. And then this year, that is totally evaporated, which has really exposed the back end that they even spent some money trying to fortify in the offseason and put a first-round pick on a linebacker that they're just not seeing the return, which is just it's a surprise, but some of that does trickle over to the offense too, because we're seeing the injury bug now just absolutely ransack that offense. They're down multiple offensive linemen. They've spent a pile of money on Curtis Samuel and he's been in, out, in, out, and then mostly out. So it's been tough. The one consistent thing there really has been scary. Terry has been productive and that's at least a boon to the managers that have him. Even Logan Thomas, who kind of cracked out as a, serviceable tight end last year has been out with soft tissue injury and is still currently on the IR. So it's been a tough one for the football team. Will they turn it around? I guess only time's really going to, going to tell us. I mean, the good news is they play in the NFC least. So (laughs) there's always that On to our next topic here. It's finally happened. We projected it all off season and it finally came to pass that Zach Ertz is no longer a Philadelphia Eagle and is on to a franchise that has everything going for it. Kit, what do you think his, his deal is going to be here in Arizona? I don't love it. I mean, 
it, he was splitting time at tight end with with Goddard, but was ostensibly like the third option. It seemed like over Rager, even maybe. Uh, in Arizona, they just have a lot of good receivers. You know that I, I think maybe I'm a little sour because like there was Dan Arnold hype last year, and then he just didn't get targeted, and it, it just feels like he could be a safety blanket, and they'll be in the opportunity to score touchdowns a lot because the offense is prolific, right? So he he could end up. I think he's a viable tight end after you get past you know the first five or something. It's all just blah. Uh, but it's not my favorite location for it, for landing spot for him, given that he was traded. Brandon, do you think he's mostly a, just a red zone weapon, or do you think he really gets integrated into that offense? No, I I don't think he gets enough volume in that offense. Uh, Hopkins, Green, Kirk, Edmonds, and Moore are all between 38 and 28 targets right now. So I'm not sure if he gets more targets than any of those guys. Um, and then their, their top tight end target guy right now is Max Williams, uh, who's next, you know, sixth on the team with 17. So I'm sure he'll have more than Max Williams, but not more than any of the guys I just named. Yeah, let's face it. The trade came in a kind of an awkward time, at least five weeks in. There's going to be an integration period for him to try and learn the playbook and figure out how to fit into that system. And then you've got a guy in Kyler Murray who hasn't really ever had a real tight end to use. So it's, Kind of a, a new piece for a guy who's never really integrated that. So how he fits remains to be seen. The coaching staff is certainly creative enough offensively to get him in there and get him functioning and productive quickly. That offense is largely predicated on hitting seams, but I really hate it for Edmonds because that presence at a tight end is going to eke into some of those running back check down targets that he was feasting on and made him kind of fantasy valuable that may eat into that a little bit if he doesn't pick it up on the ground a little bit more. I mean, we're at this point now, any minute now, Connor's leg's going to fall off. So he'll probably get more carries. I actually disagree, Don. I, I think uh, he won't dip into Edmonds' targets because Edmonds is the guy between the 20s, right? So he comes out in the red zone and, and they let Con Connor, you know, push it in. But um, the the – the twenties, the, the middle, you know, 80 yard stretch of the field. That's not where they need Zach Ertz. If they're going to want to utilize him, it'll be in the red zone. So if anything, you know, however many uh, carries James Connor has, those might be the ones that go away. Well, it's certainly an offense that has bogged down in the red zone to this point. We've seen them get opportunities and then it's fade to D hop, fade to D hop, fade to D hop. It'll be nice for them to have another opportunity and somewhere else to go with the ball, and another concern for defense is to kind of try and think about. We talk about one tight end on the move that could become valuable, and another that now heads to the IR. Buffalo lost Knox here over the weekend after a tight end touchdown on the elusive tight end run play it was called back to, to an Emmanuel Sanders hold. What's the impact here? Is there a tight end that we need to know about, Brandon? No, I, I don't I don't think so just because um you know he relied on on the big play kind of he you know three catches for a hundred yards he started off against the Chiefs and and there's no other tight end or no other player on our roster that can do that. Um so certainly not within the Bills roster. Nobody's gonna step up and fill, you know, his role. Um he'll be back soon. He played the rest of the game. He even threw that little shot put pass two point conversion to Josh in the end zone after hurting his uh, his hand or his wrist. So, um, no, I think he'll be back soon. And um, and there's nobody really else who you should be looking for on the roster. Do you think maybe and maybe just because I, I like him, uh, Gabe Davis could fill that role? He's big. He's shown propensity i think to like randomly have three catches for 80 yards in a score uh so I, I don't know i'm just curious uh if you think you know uh, he's not gonna play tight end obviously but he could kind of take on that role of being the deep shot guy <laughs> yeah he was a guy who i was excited about going into the season and he's sort of disappointed me yeah. you know to this point through six weeks um so i think he absolutely could i think he's talented enough and to be honest they have just favored Emmanuel Sanders, who looks, you know, good. still good, right? Yeah. Um, so he's been, you know, the guy, and he's been starting and and getting those deep passes that I thought Davis would get. But yeah, that's a good point. Maybe 
um, now's a good time to uh, to buy low on Gabe Davis. Yeah, we're not talking about a whole lot of targets that are going to just jump out as anywhere because Knox really wasn't targeted that frequently. So it's probable that Cole Beasley and Emmanuel Sanders just see a slight uptick until Knox is back. That's probably really all it's going to do is they'll just go to three wide more frequently or maybe they move a running back in or something like that. That's an easy to compensate. And with the bye week included in one of the weeks of his absence, that definitely helps Knox and Knox fantasy managers for sure. Tampa Bay is kind of an interesting deal. The offense is a legit juggernaut. The defense just is not. And now have lost yet another corner. I I don't know if there's diapers in the stands or what's going on with the secondary there, but boy, everybody who signs goes down. Bad deal. But is that going to be good for us as offensive fantasy managers? That keeps the Tampa juggernaut in games longer, as far as I'm concerned which just speaks to more targets. And realistically, who do we see the standout being in this? Kit, what do you think? So I think the answer to your first question is yes. I mean, yeah, they have the firepower to shoot it out if they get scored on, right? Uh, In terms of who benefits, I don't know if I'd call anyone out. I mean, um, I feel like the three receivers have pretty distinct roles. Uh, Maybe it benefits Lenny because Lenny does seem to be the the only pass catching back, right? Ronald Jones is known to be very deficient at that. Uh, even if, you know, Fournette maybe in the past hasn't been excellent. Uh, so, you know, him going from getting two catches a game to getting four or five is, is a pretty significant, you know, thing because running back touches sometimes, you know, 10 chunk per, per touch per catch type thing, a uh, 10 yard chunk per catch. So he's the one, I guess I would, I would call out. And then uh, he'll also, he seems to be like the full-time back. So he's getting goal line work too. So he'll have to score more. Um, so all receivers, I think, benefit, but I don't know if I would say any one of them benefits more. Uh, Fournette's the one I, I kind of come back to, I guess, and Brady, who's just going to have like 5,500 yards this year or whatever. It'll be a well, bajillion yards and an equal number of touchdowns. Yeah, and yeah. Once again, Don, the Angels wonder is the Angels wonder. Don, you mentioned snipers up on the roof taking out these corners. I think Brady hired these snipers so he can boost <laughs> up his career stats. Yeah, there you go. Dude, if it's one thing that B.A., has always done it's keep the hammer down on the offense bruce arians loves to throw the rock he loves to play offensive football and has always been of the mindset that if we possess the ball they don't and we'll score as much as we can as often as we can and continue to do such until the game ends it's starting though to look a little belichick-esque in that it's not the same cast of characters every week it's a different guy based on situations we just watched Leonard Fournette almost single-handedly destroy the Eagles. And then A.B. just feast. But then folks who have Evans and Godwin know all too well that all they did all week was just run decoy routes and maybe get a token target, and that was about it. Is yeah, the good. offense actually too diverse for fantasy owners? I was going to say, I think it's it's a little annoying, right? I think they all basically become what Mike Evans has always been, which is you have to tell yourself, hey, you need some steadying assets, you know, on your roster to make sure they're going to week in, week out perform. Uh, but then it's nice to have, you know, if you do have that, then it's nice to have the boom bust guy. And I think they kind of all basically become that, right? Where in a given week, you know, one of them is going to go for 100 and a score. You don't know what's going to be. But at the end of the year, they're probably all going to be top 24 or better receivers. Um So, yeah, I mean, I think it changes your outlook and it is annoying as a fantasy manager, but any one of those receivers will win you some weeks, I think, as well. Brandon, with Gronk out and continuing to be out, O.J. Howard caught himself a touchdown and started to flash a little bit anyway. Is there finally a little flicker of light going on in his head or is he still just the guy who teases us forever? I'm not I'm not buying O.J. Howard. Simple answer. Plain and simple. And yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Means. I don't have much more on that. Yeah, I think Gronk come back comes back in the next two weeks, um, and I don't see an avenue for Audrey Howard to make it onto my team. Yeah. Now, does Fournette become sustainable here? Because he certainly started to take the lion's share. If you look at the points the last couple of weeks, he's really frozen out Ronald Jones, and it seems like he's gonna be the guy. I yeah. think so. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's been pretty clear now for even since 
last year's playoffs that Fournette is really the only running back who Bruce Arians trusts. And when you have a coach who's been around a lot of teams and seen a, a lot of good players and a lot of bad players, um, if you lose his trust, I, I don't imagine, you know, it's it's very easy to regain it. So I don't see how Ronald Jones gets a bunch more playing time. Um, and I, I think Fournette's the guy going forward. I think he's like the only choice, literally, because Gio Bernard has kind of appeared and then disappeared. And Ronald that, Jones is just on the bench. That being said, I want to throw it out there. You could probably get Ronald Jones for like nothing. And he's young and Lenny does get injured. Like if Lenny got injured, they'd be forced to give Ronald Jones the ball 18 to 20 times a game on a very good offense. So like, I don't know if you if you could get him, he might be a good arbitrage play, right? Where it's like, eh, even if it's not this year, you know, I don't know. I don't know what. Uh, people who have Ronald Jones are selling for, right? If it's a third, I'm all over it. If it's a second, I'm debating it. I don't know. So it depends. But uh, I, I think he's somebody who could be like, he's one of the higher value backups, I guess is all I would say. It certainly depends on your roster arc, right? Yeah. Like, are you at the win now phase? Are you at the liquidate everything that's not nailed down? What are you trying to do with your team kind of right. thing? Maybe get him as, as a throw in when you're selling off Hopkins if you're rebuilding or something like that. Yeah. Or even if you're bad, it might be worth like just, hey, roll the bones. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we talked about Tampa. Now we're on to Seattle where Russ is going to be out long term here with that hand, what amounts to a finger reconstruction. We watch the Steelers pretty much dominate them for a half and then pretty much get shown how things could be in the second half. When Gino sort of kind of the lights came on, they started throwing the rock around a little bit more. And what was a 50-yard offensive output in the first half became almost 200-plus in the second half. Is Gino going to be able to run the ship here for the rest, or do they need to look to the outside, Brandon? No, I, I think he'll be fine just because there's nobody out there who can do better than Gino right now. He was 23 for 32, uh, a 72% completion for 210 yards and a touchdown with no picks. So um, I think that'll be fine. And the only name out there really is Cam Newton. And to be honest with you, I don't see Cam Newton better doing better than 72%, you know, completion for 200 yards and a touchdown. Kit, what are you thinking? Uh, I would say that the eye test uh, gave a different impression to me of what Geno Smith did during the, the Steelers game than, than his stats. His stats did end up respectable. Uh, I agree, Brendan, that I don't, think they do go with Cam Newton because while he wouldn't throw for 72%, he might also rush in two scores or something like that. But that involves changing their whole offense. And that's not something I think Pete Carroll is interested in doing halfway through the season, just to shift back to going to the regular offense when Russ comes back. It, it just sort of schematically doesn't make sense, even though I might disagree on the point that they'd be more likely to win games with with Cam than Geno. Uh, you, you know, I think Cam does still have some dynamism that uh, is left in the tank. But, I mean, the curious thing is it hasn't been rumored at all, I don't think, unless I missed something. Uh, I didn't see anything about them talking to him or working him out, not even his agent getting a word into an ESPN reporter or anything like that. So I uh, can't imagine it's just not happening. <laughs> yeah, I only saw one, like, one of those kind of spitball in posts, like mm, Cam. They should. <laughs> like, yeah. why not? Because everybody connects the dots to the yeah. most recent starting quarterback who now no longer has a chair in the, the musical chairs game. It is worth noting that the Seahawks did claim a quarterback off waivers. They got Eason from the Colts no. as they tried to bring him back through. Yay, whatever. I Dude's have him on like the dynasty teams because I was like excited he was going to beat out. Uh the other backup on the Colts uh, and then went, went to not missing time. So kind of hope he gets some stars. We'll see. Yeah. Well, we go from one quarterback question to a huge one. Speculation this week had Sean Watson ending up in Miami and then some various other offshoots that were just kind of rumors and people really just kind of throwing stuff against the wall. But there's been enough smoke around Deshaun to Miami for quite some time here. And two ahead of the opposite direction. First of all, how could you ever try to sell to a fan base that, yeah, we want Deshaun Watson? Kit, is that a, like a logical thing, or is that really just a question for the ticket salespeople? 
Uh, I think that's a question for the ticket salespeople. I mean, NFL owners are old, old school white dudes. You know, they they kind of, I think, are more about brass tacks, more about talent. Uh, some of them are maybe starting to warm up to the idea that, hey, PR is important. But I mean, we saw with the kneeling thing, the league was like very against that. And that was coming from the owners, right? Uh, and maybe it was coming from the fans, too. I, I think it'll be a business decision as, as uncomfortable as that is to say, right? It'll be, hey, is, you know, making the playoffs going to make us more money and, and get us more uh, thing than the grief we're going to get for having Watson? Uh, I also happen to think that this is largely BS. The reporters who reported on it are very good locked in beat reporters, but I think this is the double edged sword of being a beat reporter who's has great sources, right? In that you're going to get the good info, the inside info, but if a team wants to push a narrative, they know you're going to basically put out verbatim what they say is happening. Right. And so I, I, I'm of the opinion that this is the Texans trying to get other teams interested. You know, John McClain has been a Texans reporter since the Texans have existed, I think. Uh, and he has, again, he has good info, but this could be a situation where his good source just feeds him a lie and he parrots it. Right. Uh, so that's kind of what I think the situation is. Is it a possibility that the Texans are trying to drum interest or do you think it's more likely that it might be generated from Watson's camp and Watson's managers trying to keep his name current? Yeah, fair as well. Right. The, the, the deadline's coming up. They're basically staring it down like, well, he's probably going to miss two seasons now if he doesn't get traded by the second. Yeah. Yep. I mean, Miami's a team that, Tua's flashed and then kind of regressed and then got hurt again and then flashed and regressed and then got hurt again. And so the cycle goes. But other teams have been rumored on Watson for quite some time now, probably most notably Philadelphia. And they're sitting there with what could actually turn into three pretty significantly decent first round draft picks in this coming draft. Even though it's not a great quarterback year, the fact that it's not a great quarterback year probably motivates them even more mobilize some of those draft assets and try and get an established quarterback who hey like him hate him or whatever was the top three or four quarterback in the league and could do absolutely everything with literally nothing around him so it may take a roster from direct to competitive overnight if you just plop watson right on there yeah the the eagles seem like the perfect trade partner for this because as we speak right now they are projected you know if the season ended today they would have the second overall pick Miami's pick they would have their own which would land at eight and then Indy's pick which would land at nine so three in the top nine and I don't think Jalen Hurts is the guy I think they want to make a move utilizing those three picks considering that this isn't a great QB class They can look around the league and say, oh, maybe Aaron Rodgers will be out, but does he want to come to this roster who isn't Super Bowl ready? Another guy, Russ Wilson, same situation, probably doesn't want to come to our roster who isn't Super Bowl ready. But Deshaun Watson might be a bit more desperate. It's not really up to him. It's up to the team trading him. And he's got a lot longer of a shelf life than Rodgers and Russ. You know, he's still in his 20s, so... We could build around him. Um, so the the Eagles seem like the perfect team to make this move. Yeah, Rodgers and Russ have both can only connected to West Coast teams thus far, Pro- particularly Denver for Rodgers. And then Russ submitted a team list of four teams in the uh, offseason when things were kind of looking bad. And all of them were basically West Coast-ish with the exception of Dallas. But with Dak, that's not going to be a thing. Especially now, Dak. New Orleans, and too. Deal. Yep. New Orleans so, as well. They're all Western-ish teams. Philadelphia, while a significant market, doesn't have the roster to really be close to competitive. And I would say, uh, first of all, Watson has some control and that he has a no trade. But I think at this point, him and his camp would take anyone basically that's not the Texans right because I wonder if he's regretting you know the the idea of sitting out or whatever um but but I would say if I was Philly I, I, I wouldn't do it like I wouldn't do it putting aside you know, the allegations I mean you get Watson if you can get Watson but if it's going to cost those three first round picks or the top two of them and another one like their team isn't that good they've got some flashes but p- some of the parts that are good are aging you know players that are hanging on Lane Johnson is good but 
Who knows how much longer he's going to be around? You know, the weapons, I mean, it's hard to evaluate the weapons with the way Hertz is throwing the ball right now, but I don't think the defense is good aside from a little bit of pass rushing. So like if I were them, I'd be very tempted to trade for Watson from the football talent perspective, getting a young QB who's a franchise QB is, you know, a, something you probably never should pass up. But the other option of having three top nine picks, even if it's not a loaded, you know, skill skill position draft, it's an NFL draft. There's going to be some very good players in the top nine, right? And they could kind of set themselves up with some cornerstones there uh, and then say, hey, we get Hurts even another year if it doesn't go horribly. And then we figure it out. And then we are that attractive destination that other QBs want to come to and we can choose to do what we want. I don't know. Two final quick thoughts on what you just said, Quit or Kit. Sorry. Um, I think, A, if you have the opportunity to go get that guy, you go get him. He When he's on the field, he's a top three guy. He's a top five guy at worst. You know, he um, is the type of quarterback who there aren't many guys like this, but when they are your quarterback, they elevate the play of everybody around, you know, on the field, on their team. So Jalen Hurts is not doing that. Carson Wentz certainly did not do that. Their roster, not that long ago, won a Super Bowl. Obviously, a lot of those guys aren't there anymore, but, you know, they they have the ability to put together a Super Bowl caliber roster. And I just think if you have the opportunity to go get that guy, you get him. Hey, going back to last year, I'm kind of on record as not being a Hurts guy. He definitely just doesn't have the arm talent. While athletically gifted, the arm just isn't there. It's not playing, and he's leaving plays on the field because of it. We've seen it quite a bit with Smith being underthrown several times, Rager having guys beat down the field, and he either overthrows them or underthrows them because the accuracy just isn't there. But the Eagles aren't doing a single thing to help him either. He's basically had the hardest offense to try and run because all they're doing is running RPO that has complicated read play after play after play. They refuse to run the ball for reasons. Lord knows with two capable backs, they refuse. So it's odd. There's speculation now that Sanders doesn't understand the offense and that's why they're not running. There's speculation that they just don't trust the decision-making or that Hertz is running RPO and just refusing to turn the ball over to the back. I mean, who knows who gets why it's just an odd deal. And, at this point, in year one already, Sirianni's under fire, the defensive coordinator is under fire, and Hertz is under fire. So Philly is ablaze, and the faithful are getting very restless, which in Philadelphia means battery snowballs and all the worst possibly coming, which just keeps me super entertained. We go from there and speculation land to Cleveland, where just everybody is broken. Two monster running backs, boo-boos and broken. And now Baker is injured and unable to play. Now, we realize that we're recording this on Thursday night as the game is currently going on in case Keenum is playing, and the Ernest has already scored a touchdown, so good on him. Long term, though, because so many people are so dependent on the Cleveland running backs in particular – and to a lesser extent, Baker and OBJ, like, oh, God, what do, what do we do? And it's not just them. The offensive line is, like, half-wrecked. Brandon, let's talk with the running backs first. Green Hump just hit IR. Chubb has kind of avoided the IR but is still beat up and not playing. What's the outlook like, and what can we expect from either of those two going forward? For just the running backs, I – I think they're buys. I think when they're on the field, they can win you a game. Um, I think they have a high floor based on how good their offensive line is when healthy, obviously, and their scheme that they run. Um, So I think they're buys. So I, if we're just talking about the running backs, uh, I'm all in on both hunt. I'm with you. They're both kind of in that boat where they're super valuable. Their value has not decreased and will not decrease. Look, you expect in a 17-game season that your starting running backs will probably miss one here or there. Or now with the advent of the three-game IR, which has actually been really beneficial for a lot of people. Yeah, I think it's been awesome. (laughs) That's been a super solid ad. It's important you use those spots in your league and you're able to just snipe some guys off the waiver wire. 
And it definitely is rewarding people who are doing the deep dives into the fantasy benches and know the backups to the backups or are, as we always say, following the beat writers because they're the ones who have direct contact and access to the teams and know what's up. So, Kit, I'm going to throw you a different one. I'm going to ask you about OBJ. And now, does that mean it's uh, power to the peoples? Donovan Peoples-Jones? Come on. <laughs> Uh, DPJ Flash the last couple games. I mean, I know that uh, you know JJ, our uh, our usual host, for uh, take his hiatus, is a huge DPJ fan. Uh, and you know, I like what I see uh, when I when I watch it. I mean, the thing I think is, I've always been a big Baker fan. Not saying he's done great, but like, I don't know, little guy with swagger with a cannon arm, just a ten, ton ton of ton of arm talent. Uh, but I, I'm getting to the point where like, I don't know, he when things are right. He looks good, but he doesn't seem like he elevates the offense. And maybe part of it is the offense, right? They have two such good running backs. They have such a good run blocking offensive line. They don't want to try to do it that way. But it seems like maybe that lack of practice or the lack of preparedness for those situations means when he has to win you the game, he's pretty consistently not won them the game. Uh, and so I'm wondering if we're getting to the point where, like, they didn't give him a contract extension, which now I think is looking a little bit smart. Um, I wonder if in this offseason – I don't know. The, the marriage might disintegrate. You know, I, I think there's a chance they could be looking elsewhere. I think there's other teams that would say, hey, we'll let Baker throw 40 times a game and he could do good for us. It just feels like it could be that sort of perfect storm of like he's not right for this team. And the team has kind of lost a little bit of confidence in him. So we'll, we'll see. But I, I've sort of changed my tune on Baker. I know in the offseason I tried to give up car and a first for Baker. Cause I was like, yeah, hey, I'll just be a starter for eight years and who knows about car. And now I'm like, Oh God, I wouldn't even do that swap straight up, you know? Uh, yeah. Cause I'm just not sure. Brandon, what do you think? Is it some of the offense or is it just that Baker's always going to be in that kind of like quarterback 20 ish range? I think it's Baker. I'm, I'm off Baker. I, I think I've seen enough to be honest. I agree with basically all of what Kit just said. They, didn't give him a contract um, and they are a really smart front office right now. They're probably a top three front office in Cleveland run by Andrew Barry, incredibly intel intelligent guy. Um, their last few drafts have been incredible. Um, so I think they know what they're doing. And I think they know that Baker is not the guy to win them a Super Bowl, which is their ultimate goal, right? And they look in the division, Lamar Jackson, Baker's not going to be better than him. Joe Burrow, he's not going to be better than him. Steelers are a fantastic run organization. You probably think they figure out the quarterback position. So, you know, at best, Baker will be, or the Browns will have the third best quarterback in their division if they stick with Baker. I think Andrew Barry and the rest of the guys up there are too smart uh, to stick with them. So, I'm a sell if you have Baker, uh, even though he's at a pretty low point right now. You know, I love having Baker around only as my third QB because he's to this point, he's been really durable. You kind of know what you're getting. He's never going to push for a, like a real high position on your roster. He can be attained pretty reasonably. He's just a good depth piece to have. But if you're counting on him to start, you're probably in a bad way. It's going to be an interesting offseason, just quarterback carousel wide. And we'll get into that later in, in the season once things start to show themselves a little more. Starting to hear rumors in Pittsburgh that the next guy after Ben, they want a veteran. They don't really want to reboot with a, a rookie. So that could get interesting because if news starts getting out, maybe a Russ starts to get interested in that kind of an opportunity with those wide receivers in Pittsburgh Ooh, and fun. a solid that'd running back. Fun. That could get interesting pretty quick. But things that are also getting pretty interesting pretty quick, Kyle Pitts has really flashed. And rookie tight ends don't do that, like, ever. Kit, do we think the flash is real for now that he's on the scene already? Or is he going to kind of regress a little bit when some guys start to come back off of injury or absence? So I think he's going to be the number two target for the rest of the season. And I anticipate, you know, I don't expect every game to be what he did against the Jets with Ridley out uh, in London and, you know, getting targeted. He, you know, he did things that were like, oh, yeah, this is what he did at Florida. You know, it's weird for me when I watch him. He doesn't look he's got the Derrick Henry effect where he doesn't look that fast or quick because he's so big. But then it's like, oh, he's by that guy and catching it over that guy. So, OK, um, I, th I think he's a top 
six tight end for this year and solidifying himself, you know, if he has a couple more games like that, even over, you know, scattered over the next eight, uh, where he could make a very good case for the dynasty tight end one. Um, so yeah, I expect him to keep it up. The, the, that whole offense has been disappointing, but the defense is so bad. They're going to have to throw a lot. Matt Ryan's not done yet. Uh, so I, I just think, I think short answer is yes. I think that, that he's going to keep it up to a moderate extent. The two for 35 game is now looking like the exception, not the rule. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I think he's good to go. Brandon, his outlook seems huge, particularly in the dynasty format. He was the 101 for a lot of drafts this year, and we expect that to continue. I'm more interested in Ridley's value now. Is his value going to continue to be kind of in that top tier wide receiver range? Or is he going to start to kind of fade a little bit in the next year or so? No, I, I think he fades. And a big reason for that is Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan is not passing the eye test for me right now. Um, he's just, he's looking very old and the O-line isn't good. And he already wasn't a mobile quarterback. So in most recent years, he's done a good job of getting the ball out, even with pressure on his face. But now it looks like it's, it's affecting him just because, you know, natural wear and tear, his reflexes aren't as fast. Maybe, you know, it's just, he's, he's getting older. So I think Matt Ryan will prevent Kelvin Ridley from reaching that, you know, I mean, last year he was the fifth overall receiver in PPR format. So I don't think he gets there again. I don't think he gets there. And the evidence this season is definitely that you're right, but just volume, like, isn't he going to get 10 targets a game? Like Russell Gage, Zacchaeus, uh, you know, uh, Hayden Hurst, uh, I guess Cordero Patterson started to get, it took up some targets, but like, I, I just feel like, on volume alone, yeah, wide receiver five isn't happening, right? Uh, and he hasn't been getting hit downfield. But I'm just still all in on on Ridley, both for this year, and then we could debate whether for Dynasty, you know, if Ryan moves on, what happens. But I don't know. So that that makes sense. But then I guess I guess the flip side of that would be almost I would counter your your Pitts argument, where if he is second overall in targets on the team. You know, he is going to be a stud. But last year, uh, Russell Gage had the second most targets. He had 109 targets, which, you know, that's an awesome number. And he was wide receiver 37, um, only averaged 11.3 points in uh, PPR format. So um, but wouldn't his stats have made him like tight end two or, or four or something? 11.3 <laughs> would have put him. Yeah, right. Yeah, it would have been six ish. So, yeah, okay. so, I mean, if, if Pitts does Russell Gage's last year, that's fine, right? I mean, that's a great rookie tight end year. <laughs> Particularly in the we, tight end premium format. Sure. Yeah. yeah. All right, fellas. Let's uh, take a moment here. We're all at that point in the season where we pretty well know what we've got as a team. We're looking at our rosters and we're like, okay, go time or burn it all down time. This is where you start to really see the teams that are going to check out and you want to get the owners that we all know they exist. Okay, we flamed out that we check out. You want to catch them before they bail or they start to not pay attention. And this is where prices start to come down or at least fluctuate. Are you trying to augment your team or are you trying to gain assets for next year? to build your team and take advantage of those guys who are really going for it. So we're going to play a little game, we'll call it the contender special here. It's what would it take? Then we're going to look at two sides of the coin here. Brandon, you're going to be the, if you're acquiring and Kit, you're going to be the, if you are selling for the first category, which is quarterbacks. Aaron Rodgers, the ageless wonder continues to be excellent is quarterback 11. As we speak. And after the week one clinker that really put the fear of God and the question of does he even care into everyone's head? He's been electric. What would it take if you were a contender and you were trying to get yourself some Aaron Rodgers shares? It would take for me to sell. Um, you're trying to buy him from me, I guess. Is the right? Is that the setup? Yeah, you're trying to buy. So you're trying to acquire. Would you be willing to so, give up? I guess. What would I be willing to give up? I'd be willing to give up in in I'll say we're we're assuming a super flex format here. Yep. Um I think it it starts with a first, right? Because that's obvious. Um after that, it's gotta be a 
player who is startable, right? So a, a guy who is a wide receiver or a running back who you can plug in tomorrow and help out a guy. Now that doesn't really help you out if you're a contender. Um, but if the other guy is selling Aaron Rodgers um, and he's looking for a first plus, um, he's probably looking for another pick, let's say a second. I'd be willing to do a first and a second to give up Aaron Rodgers. Um, Kit, would you, would you be looking for more than that? I would slightly. You know, I mean, if I'm selling Aaron Rodgers, I know it's because he probably won't be useful for me in my competitive window. So you, you've got sort of that data point on me, but I know he's going to help you try to win. So it's it's two firsts or a first and a good, and a, it doesn't have to be startable now, but a good young player, I, you know, I like, right? So, I mean, maybe I'd say, give me a first and Brandon Ayuk. Uh, but, it, you know, the first is going to be bad, right? Because uh, I'm giving you Aaron Rodgers and you're already looking to acquire Aaron Rodgers. Uh, so, you know, the 11th pick, it needs to be something pretty substantial to move the needle to get me to say yes on Rodgers, I'd say. For me, if I'm the, the person selling Rodgers, I'm asking a first, a second, and a player. If I'm the person trying to acquire, for me, you're getting my one. I'm probably willing to give you my two. And I might, if I'm really sure I'm going to win this deal, and that's the thing I need is that second quarterback, I'm probably going to kick in another two the following year or a depth piece for you. So super valuable. Thus far this year, David Carr has been the quarterback 13 and with one week thrown out has been very, very good. The Raiders are more than willing to throw the ball. We've had a young wide receiver emerge in Henry Ruggs and surprisingly he just keeps on going and it hasn't even been a banner year for Waller. So Kit, you are now trying to acquire David Carr for your roster. What are you looking to give up or what would you be willing to give up to get him for your team? Yeah. So this might sound like heresy, but it's actually probably similar to Rogers. I don't think anybody has uh, increased his value more at a quarterback position. That might not be true. There might be someone else out there, but he's <laughs> increased his value a lot to me this year. I mean, I think he's looked good. Uh, the weapons are emerging a little bit. And I think the Gruden thing kind of lends itself to them wanting some sort of year over year consistency, right? I mean, they don't want to completely scrap it unless Mayock gets fired. But even then, Carr's shown enough that I think he's a starting QB for the next, you know, three to five years, which I think was a little bit of a question for some people. I, I believed in it, but over the off season. Um, so I'm look, I'm looking to, sorry, give up a one and a two. I would give up a one and a two. Uh, and, you know, if I get pushed uh, to, to your point, um, he's not necessarily a guy I'm buying saying like, okay, this is what's definitely going to put me over the top because he's going to have his 14 point games, but he's guys say, okay, I have my QB two for years. I'm good. I, I now, now can build around that. That's kind of yeah, what I think. He's in that age window where he's 32. So he's valuable yet. It's not like he's the end of the road is in sight. So right. he's definitely going to be around for the next three anyway, and be productive for that. Yeah. So Brandon, you are now selling him. What are you yeah. looking for? Well, I'm I'm probably not going to be selling David Carr, but Derek Carr. <laughs> I was um, going to say it. But... You know what? I Carr do that every Carr single Carr. time, and it's written on the paper. I know. I saw it written. I was like, why did he say David? Written on the paper. It's on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I'm selling Derek Carr, though, the, the current Las Vegas Raiders quarterback, um, I would need a one and – a player um, such as, and I'm only, or I'm partly saying this because he's on my screen as we speak, uh, Javante Williams. If, if I get a player like that, um, I think on top of a first, uh, I'd be willing to do like that for. Two, one, sorry, that's equivalent of like two ones plus, right? I mean, because no one's think? selling Javante. Well, Javante was a first round pick. Do you think anybody's selling him for a first straight up? They drafted him? The, I don't know. There, there are guys who get fickle about stuff. Yeah, he hasn't maybe, really produced. Maybe. I mean, he, I don't think he's had a game that he's really been over like 15 and he's had a lot of sevens and nines. So yeah, I don't know. I, mean, I, yeah. I like Derek Carr a lot and I would scoff at the idea of adding Javante Williams to my first, uh, but yeah. <laughs> How about this? What, what if you are selling a quarterback and, and you're in a league where um, your team situation is, bleak for the next you know year or so um would you be good with a first and an injured 
running back like Akers or Dobbins. Yes, yes, that's that's right in, right in my alley, right? That 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 would that would pique my interest as a as a car owner. I would I would say, hey, you know, even if the first is going to be bad, even if it's going to be you know eight or nine or lower, uh, I also get kind of an upside, you know, dice roll who could be you know a couple of years of RB two plus. So yeah, that that that's that's more attractive to me. It's interesting would- that you guys are bringing in the. I don't want to call it the damaged goods category, but the guys who are out on the year and have questions around them, like the Dobbins, Akers with the Achilles coming back, that's certainly a more challenging injury than the ACL. Or like a Juju Smith-Schuster who's on IR for the remainder of the year with a shoulder, but will come back and be productive for somebody, probably not Pittsburgh, but somebody. So it's interesting that you're we're starting to get into the capital argument for those guys. And that bridges me into a player right now that should be coming back here off the pup in with the saints not so long in one michael thomas if you're looking to to really kind of get something for your team here we'll go brandon what would you be willing to give up to acquire one michael thomas right now i'm super indifferent on on michael thomas i don't feel strongly about him either way because i don't know what to think about him. I don't know what to think about Jameis Winston week in, week out. I don't know what to think about this Saints offense and the Saints team week in, week out, much less a wide receiver who was good two years ago and, you know, might be good in three weeks now. Um, So I don't know. The most I'd give up is probably a second. um, And that might seem low just because he was the overall wide receiver one not that long ago. But I have no idea what to think of Michael Thomas and the Saints team. And I might, you know, I, I think I'm I'm selling him low just because, like I said, it, it wasn't that long ago that he was very, very good. Um, but he seems very risky to me. Kit, if you were trying to liquidate that player, what would you be asking? A uh, first. I mean, not more, but not less. I, w- I wouldn't take the second. And, and I think the reality is, I saw some stat today that like no one in their offense has been targeted more than I don't have the number in my head, but like they're distributing targets and not focusing on anyone basically because none of them are good uh, is is my, is my take on it. Right. So I think uh, I still wouldn't want to give up a lot for him. I don't know if I'd give up my first, if I was like a surefire contender and had a wide receiver need, I probably would, uh, you know, but I do think, let me say this. I think his value right now, is going to be less than it will be in you know two months from now. Uh, e- even unless he gets re-injured, right? Unless unless he hurts himself again, which is a risk, right? And you're hedging on that risk a little bit. But I just imagine he's going to get enough targets, and I still think he's good. He's not old, right? That that he's going to put a, together a couple games that make some people say, "Oh, okay, Michael Thomas is back," right? Uh, and so. Yeah, I, I, if I could get that sweetheart deal, I mean, I can't imagine anyone selling him for a second, but two seconds, you know, I, I might do two seconds, especially if one is going to yeah. be late. Um, that that's I would be interested in doing that, but pretty similar to Brennan in that I'm like scared and don't know what's what. <laughs> Let's dip our Kit, toe back in. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, real quick. Uh, to your point, Kit, um, the leading uh, target guy on the Saints right now is Elvin Kamara. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. I think there were some leading air yards, I think, is Callaway, but he has like 13 catches or something through five games. He has 13 seven. catches on 21 targets uh, for yeah. three scores. Yeah, yep. yeah, so they could use a guy who wants to vacuum up targets, right? Uh, which Michael Thomas has been known to do, but we'll see. But I, I similar have the distrust of Jameis and the whole offense. Let's dip our toe into the depth pool and guys who are going to be that player that you can use to flesh out your bye weeks and really solidify yourself, but not going to be one of your stars or studs, but somebody who's going to be super, certainly very useful. I'm looking at right now a Cole Beasley or an Emmanuel Sanders because functionally they're the same dude in Buffalo, Buffalo because on any given week they're getting the same target share and or productivity range. Kit, if you were trying to acquire either one of those players as a depth piece to flesh out your roster, what would you be looking for? Or what would you go in as your offer with? Uh, it's good. I mean, okay, if it's on a contender, I just assume it's not happening, right? If, but if they're on, if they're on, um, you know, a rebuilding team, I obviously offer a third. I don't think I can get to a second. I mean, it really depends. If I have a great team that I know has a wide receiver deficiency, I'll give up the second 
probably. Uh, but that's just not the type of move I like to make, right? I'd rather shop around and use that second to try to get somebody who I think has a little more sustainable value. Um, so I, I don't know. It's, it's a cop-out answer to some extent, I know. But but I, I, I'd really say uh, third for sure. Second, you'd have to really you know, time my arm. Maybe throw in something else. I, I don't like lower picks, so the idea of like getting a fourth back means – virtually nothing to me but another guy who i might be able to start in a random week uh or might be a flyer something like that uh i would do the second for you know one of them plus that so brennan you're looking to sell either one of those to a contender what are you going to go in with yeah i'm i'm kind of like kit where i'm not super interested in in a fourth round rookie pick um third a little bit more but it doesn't you know move the needle a ton um, if I'm selling, let's say Emmanuel Sanders, who's having a decent year, um, most touchdowns among wide receivers on the team and, um, only 50 less yards than Stefan Diggs, um, I'd be looking to get a younger player back. So I'd be looking for probably a receiver just to, to fill that void. Um, but I, I don't, I'm not interested in a guy like, um, or, or a pick like a, a bunch of fourths and, you know, a third. What about like a straight Gabe Davis Manny swap? Would that work? That probably works, right, for both sides? I'd rather, yeah. I'd, yeah, if I'm a rebuilding team, I'd rather have Gabe Davis. Yeah, yeah. See, there it is. And those, those guys can be super valuable to get because they can get you through an injury. They can plug in and still get you meaningful points. Yeah, you're not going to get your 25 or 35 point weeks out of – what would be your a player but if you have an injury or something having that guy on your bench can make all the difference so for me i would entertain the idea if i'm going all in to get this i'd go as high as a second if i really needed it and had nothing else just to make sure i'm icing myself that if i get an injury here late i've got quality depth and somebody who's not going to put up like a one in a week that i need at least a fantasy relevant 10 other guys that fall into that category for me are like a Hunter Renthro is somebody that's going to be in that neighborhood, a Cordero Patterson, who's kind of blown up. But look, he hasn't done it for any kind of consistent length throughout his career. So if you have those guys, I think it's time to start looking. All right. If 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 I'm going to add one more uh, young receiver who, you know, you could be looking to trade around this time, um, the his first three games of this season also his first three games of his career he never reached four uh half ppr fantasy points and then this these past three weeks he never got below seven including a couple double digit point weeks that's amon ross st brown um so he's a guy who you could be looking to you know acquire in, in a couple different leagues but um uh, that's that's my two cents. That is the Debbie Dirtbag special because he was yeah. all over Amon Ross St. Brown yep. coming out of SC. And it's he's an interesting dude in a team that doesn't have a wide receiver one or a wide receiver two. They or did a until he wide broke receiver his bone, three. Yeah. So yeah, um an interesting guy to get. And maybe that's just a stash, you know, this is something good managers do. They take advantage of those situations and stash guys for next year or in the year after. So if you can get them on the dirt cheap, why not? Yeah. Sooner or later, things are going to get better in Detroit. Oh, wait. It's yeah, you Detroit. mentioned. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, maybe no. not. Uh, you mentioned Renfro, like, and I think of Amon Ross St. Brown as maybe being a Renfro, which is like low key, very valuable for Dynasty. Like, he's always a bi week spot start. Like, when you, we listed those guys, you know, there's to me, there's a huge tangible difference between Manny Sanders, who's in his 30s, and Renfro, who, like, I expect, regardless of what happens with the Raiders or his career or whatever, he's always going to be good to give you a good shot at seven to 10 points, right? Which is like weirdly valuable in, in dynasty where you start, you know, deep starting rosters and by weeks, things come up. You don't consider yep. like, he could just be a guy who's like, you start three times a season for five seasons, you know, yeah. and, and that's helps you win games. And this is another JJ special. Zach Pascal has always proven himself <laughs> yeah. Yeah. valuable on the occasion. <laughs> and this year in Minnesota, Osborne has shown up and, I really like what I see out of that kid. He's definitely developing. This is his third year in the league. Hadn't really gotten much of an opportunity or really put it all together until this year, but now he's had at least four weeks of quality production. Another guy that you could get that could really grow into something for you. 
So there you go. There's a few names to consider. There's always things out there. Definitely fortune favors the bold. So if you are in the stats and you're the, the junkie level that we are, and if you're listening to us, I assume that you are, you're out there picking through the stats and just have a pulse for your league and kind of know who's going to be available and who you think you can pry and always go for the throw in. Because if you're trying to nail down a deal and you can get a toss in like a Zach Pascal or a Hunter Renthro, that's gravy. And those kind of little things can ultimately turn in to be weak winners for you down the road. All right. So let's look a little bit. The survivor special of the week. There's a couple good ones. Uh, if you haven't used the Rams yet, yo, because Detroit is rolling into L.A. for the Rams, and uh, they're getting 15. And when Vegas gives you 15, it's probably pretty secure. Are there any other games that are standing out as one that should be easily winnable or that you should be looking for for the survivor folk among us? Yeah, I don't I don't think there's any way Rodgers loses in Green Bay to Washington. Yeah, the football team is coming in and they're getting nine. That's a healthy line. Yeah, Jets Pats is two rookie QBs. That's the only one we had listed here, right? I mean, I I, I like that because I, I think the idea that, you know, the Pats still have a solid defense and they're gonna make Zach Wilson see ghosts, right? Uh they've done in the past. So they do. Uh, yeah. And the Jets on the road thus far has been nothing more than an adventure. Yeah. And it's usually a tragic one. Yeah. And one of the things about survivors. You do have to work in a time to use teams that aren't necessarily the cream of the crop because eventually you run out. So it might be a great time to use the Pats. Good point, yeah. Especially with it being a home game. College games of the week. It's kind of an interesting slate. The college landscape is all over the place. Good Lord, Cincinnati is number two in the land somehow, some way. And yet here we are with some compelling games. For me, the one I want to watch is Clemson at Pitt because I'm interested in the quarterbacks. Pickett is working his way up the quarterback pyramid here this year. Currently, ESPN has him as at least six, if not five now, on the quarterback available depth chart. And he has done nothing but ball out pretty much all year. And then you get DJU for Clemson side, who's starting to show a little bit of why he was so highly hyped coming into this year after the tease of last year. So for me, that's the game I am most interested in catching this weekend. Anything else stand out to you guys? I was I'm interested in this. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's the one. I'm interested in seeing how the players respond to Ogeron's, you know, firing, I guess. And I, I don't know if they're going to play hard for him or, or not. It's going to be very interesting to see. Um that game against Matt Corral. Yeah, it's definitely weird the way they did it. And and I, I, I think I was going to bring it up because actually it seems like Matt Corral's unlikely to play. So I'm really curious what Ole Miss is going to do. Uh, I know they have a, a backup who has no experience if they put John Rice Plumley back there to like do a little bit of like uh, commanding the offense and the, on the run side. Uh, he converted to, to wide receiver. Um, but what I thought was sort of a, a, a pretty solid, okay, Ole Miss is going to trample this, you know, uh, bedraggled and, and downtrodden team that like you know losing its coach start kind of gets a little interesting if, if corral doesn't play which is what kiffin said is likely to happen the one more a game that's filled with college football lore usc goes to notre dame the trojans head into the golden dome to see what what goes on there <laughs> this is definitely a devi special for you guys sc has a dynamite wide receiver that you need to know about London is a man amongst boys here, and Ken Slovis has been up and down, but he's started to show signs of life and kind of flicker back in now that things have kind of settled down a little bit with kind of the coaching search and all the, the strange transitions there at SC. Whereas done. Notre one, Dame, one last one. Oh, sorry. Okay. I thought you were done. Yeah. Whereas Notre Dame has a very interesting running back in Kieran Williams and a dominant tight end Myers. Worth a watch. Yeah, my bad. Um, I'll, no I'll throw, throw one last one in here. Um, it's going to be a blowout, but Oklahoma is playing Kansas, and I don't think Spencer Rattler plays another snap for Oklahoma, but Caleb Williams is really, really good, and he's yeah. going to put up a lot of points on Kansas. So if you just want an enjoyable game to watch, you know, a, a team just 
bulldoze another team and, and throw up a bunch of points, that's going to be a fun one. That's a great one to catch the first half of. Yep. Because after that, the starters are going to be gone. <laughs> Maybe Spencer Rutler will get a snap. You see, he <laughs> might, he might, yeah. he might get the triumphant return, but he's definitely gotten jumped on that depth chart because that young man Williams is phenomenal. The masterful, masterful comeback he orchestrated against Texas didn't think it was possible for a team that should have been able to run the ball with Bijan Robinson as an ice that game with that lead. But hey, college is fickle. All right, folks, again, do us a solid and check us out at riderdynasty.com. Look for the podcast anywhere that you can kind of get it. We're on Podbean. We're on anywhere that podcasts are available. Guys, it's time for tags. Brandon, lead us off. I am on Twitter at BCTAF. Um, go Bills. That's all. Kit. Uh, I'm on Twitter at KitV underscore Dynasty FF and uh, on Reddit at uh, KitKit123. And I guess I'll try to be optimistic. And Dan Jones is going to have a turnaround week this week. It's fine. It's all okay. <laughs> Hope springs eternal, my friend. <laughs> Hope springs eternal. Guys, you can always reach out and get me at Ryder Dynasty. The fellows will always let me know what's going on. And if anybody uh, reaches out and wants to talk to the social media Sasquatch before I retreat back to my cave for another week, pay attention to the college landscape, folks. Start doing your scouting for next year now so you know whether you want to push those draft picks in or if you really need to start hoarding them. Because if you're trying to save yourself in a quarterback poor year and you're going to turn in with like a wide with like a draft pick at like eight or nine, it's not going to happen. You're not going to have it. So you're going to get like the third best wide receiver or the third best running back. So it may be an opportunity that you can take that pick, find the uninitiated and turn that into actual somewhat proven capital for yourselves so evaluate your teams be real with yourself and as always guys take care and enjoy the games we'll see you later